Hello, everybody. This is a groovy Apache Fortress. Today, I'm going to discuss how the groovy programming language can improve existing mature Java projects. So uh, keep in mind that I'm new to groovy. We'll talk more about that in a bit. So I'm not bringing an expert's perspective here. I'm, I'm bringing an, an old timers Java programmers perspective new to groovy. And, and the benefits that I found when I started using the language. As a secondary objective, I'm going to discuss a bit security authorization using Apache Fortress because that's the API set that I experimented with and I feel it's important to at least give a brief introduction in order to understand uh, the, the benefits and the gains. So these slides and the sample projects that I'm getting ready to discuss are can be found behind that link. That's my blog there, and the links are there. All of the code and the, uh, is, is in the public domain, most of it released under Apache license or uh, similar. And so uh, feel free to, to try that out. My name is Sean McKinney. I am a software architect with Simus. And I am also sitting on the chair of the Apache Directory Project Management Committee. That chair rotates every two years. And so it's my turn to have the honor. And uh, I do work a bit with OpenLDAP, the OpenLDAP project. My company, Simus, is the commercial sponsor for OpenLDAP, and hence my involvement in the project. And also Apache Fortress, which is the project that I'm involved with, uses directories like the OpenLDAP directory and the Apache directory. So as far as my background, the timeline up here kind of gives you a sense of, of, of who I am and what I've done. Uh, you know, I've been programming since really the, the middle 80s when I was in the university and I was doing some mainframe stuff. And then as 1990, uh, the new decade hit, I transitioned into a client server type of programmer and started with the C language, did that for a number of years. And then in, uh, around 98, I started with C++, changed companies and was on a project that had a C++ project that took about a year to write. And uh, in 99, we started a pilot with about four, maybe five developers where we converted that code to use Java in 30 days. So based on that success, the project switched gears and changed to Java, and then my team became strong proponents of Java throughout the company. And uh, as you can see, I then did Java pretty much exclusively for nearly 20 years, until just a couple years ago, I started experimenting and dabbling in Python and uh, PHP, and just this year, uh, started using Groovy. So I am very new to Groovy, although I am an old programmer. So this is an old programmer, new to Groovy talk. So our agenda, uh, we're gonna look at the project goals that I had for when my intention or my, my aims for using Groovy and why I started using it. I'm gonna talk a bit about life before Groovy. We're gonna look at an example, which is the Apache Fortress authorization uh, tool. And then we're going to look at after Groovy and see if things have been helped and uh, a, a short demo. So um, at the beginning of the year, I attended a uh, Java meetup session. In, it was in January. And a friend of mine, Thomas Burns, gave a talk on Groovy. And Thomas is also an old Java programmer. And his, he really uh, showed us what can be done with Groovy in terms of really kind of reducing the friction of, of Java programming and, uh, you know, enhancing uh, productivity and clarity of code and being able to, to experiment. And uh, so that inspired me. And then once COVID hit and the lockdown came up, I was sort of looking for things, new things to try out. And so I started a black op and, uh, and really with the goal of, 
of taking the Apache Fortress system and experimenting with different API signatures using Groovy. And my goal was I wanted to iterate quickly through different API signatures uh, to see what worked the best in, with respect to improving user re readability and comprehension of the APIs and also to enhance the programmer productivity for implementing the APIs. And along the way, I wanted to overcome some biases that I had in terms of how the API should be shaped. And so Groovy was really ideal for this kind of a project. So for me, life before Groovy, and again, I'm a long time Java programmer. Um, I think I attended Java 1 12 times. First time was in 12, the last time was in 15. And so I certainly was aware of Groovy. I remember when Groovy was announced, I've been to many sessions on it. I always thought it was really cool, uh, but I never really had a use for it. I, I didn't think I had a use for it. So I don't wanna say I ignored it. I certainly didn't disdain it, but I didn't really feel like I needed it. So I was kind of like that grumpy programmer dude right there, just really didn't um, have a need for it. I just thought Java was good enough for me. So, you know, what was life like in 07 when Groovy sort of emerged? You know, Java had been in use for 12 years, so it was an established language. Service-oriented architecture was the rage. Everybody had a SOA team. J2EE was starting to show signs of age. You know, you think about things like Entity Beans and EJBs and other areas that were really not proving very effective for utilization. And as a consequence, Spring Framework emerged as a dominant player to overcome some of the shortcomings in the language itself. Now I say this um, as a Java guy, right? So I'm a proponent of Java. I will argue its strengths with anybody quite stridently. I love to sit around and have beers talking about it. My uh, colleagues at Simus are all C old old C programmers and they're really, they do disdain Java strongly and I have to defend it at every turn. But um, I remain strident in, in stating the strengths of Java. And at the top of the list is platform endurance. Uh, when I started client server work in the early 90s until we started the Java team in, in 99, I think I worked on five or six different platforms. There was OS2 and there was a Calm Tuxedo platform, and we had, a, you know, a, a Corba platform, and it's just every couple of years, we'd start a new project, we had to learn a new platform, and that really hurt productivity and the uh, the life of a project. So Java changed all that, and now projects have really been around for decades, and the platform has, has certainly proved the test of time. There's abundance of common libraries in Java. I don't think there's any question about that. It has a strong ecosystem not quite as strong as, as or it's, it's not as full of hot air as it was in the early days. Like my first Java 1 in 02, the Moscone Center uh, was, was literally packed full of vendors selling their wares. Uh, my last Java 1 was 15, there was maybe three rows of vendors. So the hot air has been taken out of that balloon, but the vendors that remain are um, steadfast and, and, and solid, and it has a strong ecosystem. So between a strong ecosystem and a strong platform that makes a good programming language, as far as I'm concerned, if, if a programming language has, has only one or neither of those, then it's, it's of limited value. Uh, the language itself continues to evolve. I don't think there's any question about that. Some would perhaps say too much, but it's certainly evolving. It adapts well to new tech, i.e. the cloud, cloud native. Uh, Java is, is worked quite well there. And the language itself remains popular to this day, arguably the, the, the most popular language, but certainly in the top three, sharing a spot with uh, Python and perhaps JavaScript. But there are drawbacks. Boilerplate is certainly one of them, where it's sections of code that have to be included in many places with little or no alteration. You know, programmer must write a lot of code to accomplish only minor functionality. So boilerplate is just something that us old programmers have learned to live with coming from, you know, C and C++. There was lots of boilerplate and Java had it. And I guess you can kind of find comfort in it. 
you learn to sort of, you know, it, it becomes white noise. Uh, and examples of boilerplate is try catch blocks, getters, setters, imports, constructors, punctuation, all that stuff. And so again, you know, for us old programmers, we're we're okay with it because we're we're just used to it. But for somebody new to start out, it can really be uh, an inhibitor. So here's a common example of what I'm talking about with boilerplate. You got some getters and setters and you know, there's some list processing and, and, and this and that. It really becomes kind of hard to figure out what this code's tr trying to do in there. And so, um, so that's kind of life before Groovy um, was learning to live with the boilerplate, enjoying the platform, perhaps overlooking uh, the things that, that a dynamic language like Groovy can do. Okay, so now a brief introduction into the problem space in, in which I'm involved. Authorization is my specialty. I've spent over 20 years in this uh, space. And it's just quite briefly, it's it's a function of specifying access rights, privileges to resources. So, you know, the common question of can the user do this? Can they do that? Can they update this table? Can they read that page? That's what authorization is. Role-based access control is a specific type of authorization. And that's the one that I'm quite familiar with. It is governed by a specification from ANSI, Insights 359. And it has, uh, you know, these categories of functionalities. You got RBAC zero, which is the base a system must be RBAC zero in order to be deemed compliant with the spec. That's users, roles, permissions, and sessions. You have hierarchical roles static separation of duties and dynamic separation of duties. So again, this is not an RBAC talk. Uh, this is just an introduction to kind of give a taste of the problem space that I'm in. So one of the things about this, the ANSI Insights 359 specification that I really appreciate is the fact that it has a very explicit functional specification for the APIs, the shape of the APIs, the entities that are involved and the processing that has to take place is very explicitly laid out in a language called Z notation. Z notation is a implementation agnostic way of describing functionality. And so these uh, specifications are organized into three categories of, of API sets or, or interfaces. You have the administrative APIs, which is the crud of the data. So that's, you know, editing the policy you want to add this entity, you want to delete another update, that's the admin APIs. There's review, which is the, you know, the interrogation of the policy, the reporting. And finally, there's the system, which is the enforcement. And that's what happens at runtime for the authorization type calls. Okay, so here's where I'm going to start talking about a cognitive bias that I have. And uh, there's a psychological term in psychology, it's called functional fixedness. And that's, you know, an example of functional fixedness would be to see an object like a hammer. Uh, you know, a hammer can only be used to pound a nail. You know, that would be a, a, an example of a, of a functional fixedness. Whereas, you know, someone who doesn't have that bias could see a hammer and, and could see something that they could dig a hole with or they could use it as a paperweight or, you know, any number of things. So I have a cognitive bias towards the, the functional specs and the APIs of RBAC. When I see the functional spec, you know, written like this, I have a bias to implement it exactly in the same way. And so indeed, this is a slide that I've shown many times at Apache Con and other conferences, and I'm more or less touting the benefit of the Apache Fortress API set and pointing out how it is exactly the same as the functional specifications. And that is good if you're trying to learn the functional spec, but if you're just trying to get your work done, you know, is, is this the, the best format for the APIs? Um, it, it's, it's quite complicated. There's a lot of entities there. There's a lot of different uh, uh, functions and it can be very hard to absorb. So here's the admin APIs that Fortress has. The re review APIs look like this. You can see that there's list processes that are being returned. And so, you know, list processing in Java can be quite cumbersome. And then you're passing entities in and you know, all these are behind exceptions. And um, so, um, you know, again, I've, I've, you know, for many, many years, I've had a bias in favor of APIs in, in this shape for authorization. Okay, so just a little bit about Apache Fortress. 
it is a subproject of Apache directory. The code is written in Java. There are four main components. The core is the APIs that we're discussing today. So that's, you know, the, the APIs I just showed you, they are in the core. The uh, APIs are extensive. In addition to the role-based access control APIs, there's other APIs to do things like delegated administration, password policies, reading audit logs, managing and configuring properties, uh, nearly 200 public APIs in all. So larger API sets really is indicative of higher complexity. It can be, it is extraordinarily difficult to use and understand even for someone experienced in the problem space, i.e. me. So add in a complex entity model, which Fortress has, and it gets even tougher to uh, digest. And so I'm thinking there, there has to be a better way. Can I overcome my bias and figure out a better way? Can Groovy help? Can Groovy help me redesign those APIs? Can it help me make those APIs more usable? Can I figure out a way to make them easier for users to integrate with? Can it be easier to write test cases and easier for us, the programmers, to add new features? All right, so what happened after all this? Life after Groovy, well, you know, the birds are chirping, the flowers are growing, the songs are being sang. Uh, you know, it's, you know, I'm late to the party. I'm 13 years to the party, 13 late, 13 years late to the party, but better late than, than never. Okay, read this quote from Andrew Montalenti. Not only is the code more concise, it's also much more readable. The signal to noise ratio is much better. So I really like that phrase, signal to noise ratio. That's something that really indicates what I'm trying to talk about. All of the APIs rewritten behind a, a, a groovy interface. All those you know dozens of APIs that I showed you earlier can be distilled down to just four. And, um, you know, instead of having a complex entity model that's being passed, we can just pass in dictionary, which Groovy handles quite well. And so, um, you know, certainly from just a digesting, you know, would you rather look at that right there? Or do you want to look at 50 APIs? You know, which one's easier? So here's an example of the old way using, you know, the Java APIs. And again, the signal to noise ratio, what's going on here? We're instantiating an object. What is that thing? We're setting some values and then we're, you know, we're calling a method and having to instantiate another entity. And, oh, okay, yeah, we're adding a role constraint to Dewey for this teller role. Okay, well, finally, I can kind of understand what that is as opposed to if I did it using Groovy with the Groovy wrapper, it looks more like this, which is not only is it much more concise in terms of programming, it's it, there's just a lot less noise there. It's just a lot easier to tell what's going on in, in my mind. Okay, so let's look at the demo of this code running somewhere. I have a uh, demo environment that's, you know, we got machines running in the cloud. We got uh, one machine here that is running the Fortress runtime here. And then it has a database, which is an LDAP server. In this case, it's running Simus Open LDAP for Linux. Okay, that's a native process. And then Java is a, you know, uh, Fortress is a Java app. So there's a couple projects that have to be set up. You got the Apache Fortress core that's set up. And then also this groovy Apache Fortress is running. All of that is automated behind this Ansible Fortress playbook that I wrote and have released. So if you want to try this out and if you're familiar and comfortable running Ansible and you got an extra machine around, you can try that and, and you can be set up in just a couple minutes. Okay, so these samples like the Ansible playbook I said, and the Groovy Apache Fortress project are in these public accounts on GitHub. Uh, so, you know, it's out there if you'd like to try and, and give it a look. So let's look at the code real quick. We're programmers, we look at code. So let's first look at the wrapper. So this is the Groovy Apache Fortress project and it's loaded up in IntelliJ, which is the IDE that I like. Um, and so you can see there's a package here under main, it's a, a groovy package, and here's the wrapper. So there's a, a wrapper for the access manager. There's a wrapper for the admin manager. I haven't gotten around to wrap, writing the wrapper for the review manager yet. That's work still that has to be done. But let's look at one of these. 
So here's the wrapper for the admin manager. And you can see that edit API that I was talking about earlier, and it's accepting this, this dictionary object. And then that dictionary object is this is basically handled via Jackson that Jackson will then convert from the dictionary into the entity quite nicely. So all that's handled. And then of course the, the wrapper has to do the work to figure out what kind of operations being done and then map it to the Fortress Java API. So no magic here, just simple, easy to, to write code. This was very easy to write um, for me. And so, um, and then there's another one for the access manager that it really works the same way. There's a couple methods there that I showed you earlier. There's a start, which that's how you start a, a, an authorization session. And then there's can do, which is the, you know, basically checking access rights. All right. So as far as the test cases that I wrote to verify how we did, there's two packages under the test folder in the project. There's one, uh, there's a groovy package and there's a Java package. So I basically wrote the same set of tests twice. I wrote one set using the groovy wrapper. And I wrote another set using the traditional Fortress APIs just to kind of compare and contrast how it went. So let's look at the, the, the traditional Java APIs first. So um, this is the admin manager test. So this is driving policy and uh, edit, policy edits. So we're adding policy here. We're adding users, we're adding roles, we're setting up permissions, we're granting them. And so again, we're back to this signal to noise ratio. What's actually going on here? There's a lot of noise here of processing the, uh, you know, the entities and instantiating what has to be instantiated, processing list, managing all that. It's very hard really to see what's going on. Now I wrote this test case a couple weeks ago and I am, you know, I'm the designer of the APIs that it's calling and I had trouble with the test because I had forgotten how some of that worked and I realized just how intricate it is to have to do this. And this is really a knock on Apache Fortress is complexity of the APIs. So here's the same test in Groovy with the Groovy wrapper. And so it's much easier to see what's going on here. It's just, it's just way more readable. You know, you can see, oh, okay, I'm adding these things. And what am I adding? I'm adding these things. The user that's using these APIs doesn't have to necessarily know the entity model. They just need to know sort of what they're trying to do. I'm trying to add a user. Here's the attributes. Doesn't really need to know exactly what classes have to be loaded or, or whatever. And so it's just not only are the, was it more readable, but it was just easier to do. I was able to, to write these tests in literally just a few minutes, as opposed to the other ones I showed you took me, a, you know, probably a, a couple of hours to get it right. And, um, same way with the access manager side, not quite as dramatic. So here's the Java side and you can see again, you've got to instantiate stuff and, and load entities and, and then uh, call APIs and pass it for still further entities. And it, again, it's kind of hard to understand what's going on. If you look at the groovy side, here they are. And it's just, again, a lot cleaner, a lot easier to use. And so me as a user, would I rather, you know, which way would I rather do it? You know, would I rather do it like this or would I rather do it like that? And, or I'm sorry, rather do it like that. And then, so, and then also as just having to go back later and support that code, it's just a lot easier this way. All right, so just real briefly, we'll run them in, in the test environment. So again, this is in the cloud. So there's four tests, um, four tests here. We have, uh, again, we've got the Groovy Access Manager tests. We've got the Groovy Admin Manager tests. And we got the Java Access Manager tests and the Java Admin Manager tests. And these tests are interchangeable. So I can edit the policy with, say, the Java Admin Manager tests. And I can interrogate the policy with the, uh, the Groovy Access Manager tests or vice versa. They're, they're doing exactly the same thing. So, um, how did we end up after this exercise in terms of just number of lines of code? The Java admin manager test I showed you has about 182 lines of code. The Groovy admin manager test weighs in at about half that. The access manager tests are 165. The, the access manager test in Groovy is about 92. So it's about 40% economy there on code. 
Less code to write is higher productivity, certainly. Less code to write is easier to understand also. Less boilerplate. So clearly, there is an advantage there. And uh, so I was able to overcome my bias on how APIs should be written and came up with a better way in really just a, a short amount of time in Groovy. So everything that I did could have been done in Java, but it's just there's a higher, uh, higher friction. It would have taken much longer, and it's not as convenient in many ways. Okay, closing thoughts. Read you another quote from Andrew. Groovy was written to target Java programmers. It's the dynamic language Sun should have built for the JVM as dynamic languages gained popularity and the Java language stagnated. So that article was written back in 09, 11 years ago. So I don't think he's captured, he certainly hasn't captured all the advancements that's happened to Groovy since then. But for someone like me, if you're like me and you're kind of old to Java and new to Groovy, that's a good place to start is that, is that. Apache Fortress, there's a link to our project. If you want to try this stuff out, you got any questions, join our mailing list, ask us questions, we'd be happy to support you there. And there's my contact info. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to, to give me a shout. And that's pretty much it. Do we have any time for questions? Uh, we have just a little bit of time. So um, one of the questions is, why not use Spock for your tests? Why don't I use Spock? Yeah, yeah. Just haven't got around, it, you know, just... Yeah, yeah. It's uh, more more of a functional fixedness. You know, I know how to use JUnit, so that's what I use, but sure, um, sure. have been using it for a, a long time. But yeah, I'd, um, I'd like to get around to it, certainly. Yep, I think you'll be pleasantly surprised if you if you give it a look. It's, okay. Uh, in terms I'll, of signal-to-noise ratio, it's... Um, okay. It's... it's uh, Quite a quite a nice fit. Okay, but um, yeah, there's not. I mean, we work we work with anything, so J units good as well. So yep. Um, I think that was the main question. I, I was uh, quite intrigued that you mentioned uh, Z notation, or we used to call it Z yep. notation. I, I did my PhD on that. I invented a thing called Object Z. Is that right? Yep. So um, good to see that back again. Hmm. <coughs> Interesting. Uh, it looks like there's another question. Were there any other benefits except productivity boost after introducing Groovy to the project? Well, yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, well, I'm still in the middle of this, right? So I'm, I, I've am i only been at it for a short time. I um, So th this story is still unfolding, I think. Um, so the, the actual, the Groovy wrapper hasn't been added to the Apache Fortress project yet. It's now in a side project in my in my GitHub account. So I have more things to do. But um, so the the benefits are really at this point are just what can I, uh, you know, what are they according to my opinion? Where, you know, I mean, what I would, what I really want to do is I want to um, increase the uptick of usage of Fortress. So Fortress is, I think, I don't want to say it's stagnating, but it just hasn't really, um, been widely used and I've uh, you know I'm trying to figure out why that is and I think part of it is just the the APIs are so complicated so you know ultimately what I want to do is see you know more users come into the Apache Fortress uh, way of doing things and um, so that's the ultimate benefit I think is, is try to try to help the project um, and so you know and, and a side benefit there is uh, not only productivity, but, uh, you know, comprehension. It's getting back to that 100 APIs. Somebody who's new to the project and they look at 100 APIs and they're like, oh my God, you know, what, where do I start? And uh, so if, if we can distill that down and make those um, easier to understand, then uh, that, that may help. Excellent, excellent. Well, it looks like we either put them to sleep or, um, Drove them off, Paul. No, no, you've, no, you've no, got, you've got um, good, um, good attendance. Good I think it was uh, between 20 and 30 attendees throughout the session. So that, that's great. Nice. Um, well, I really appreciate uh, having the opportunity to speak to, you know, for this track. And I'm really excited about, you know, the benefits of Groovy. And, and I want to continue that work. And uh, hopefully there will be more of these to come in the future. Yep. Excellent. 
Well, uh, thanks very much for your talk. Um, this is where the the audience would normally uh, be standing and uh, clapping clapping <laughs> you and everything at this point. So um, no, they would have left by now. <laughs> no, no, no. You still your your numbers are still right up there, so it's all, all good. Um, okay, so uh, thanks everyone for attending. Um, there's a another session that'll uh, come up uh, shortly in in a, in a few minutes' time. It'll appear on the sessions page, and uh, that'll give you the link to the uh, next session. Um, Sergio, who's going to uh, be talking about Micronaut and Groovy, so uh, stay around for that. Otherwise, um, thanks again, Sean, and that was uh, very interesting. Thanks, thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye.